Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm, I'm glad to see you all here today. And um, today we have the special pleasure of having a, a guest speaker from Ancient Dragon Zen Gate Temple in Chicago. Paula Lassars is a ordained priest there. She ordained with Dan Layton. And um, she is a practice leader in that uh, temple. She also has a long term, even longer term interest in Shaolin Kung Fu and uh, is uh, a teacher at a studio there in, in Chicago. So this morning, uh, she will be speaking with us about skillful means, upaya, skillful means. So, um, and uh, welcome, welcome, Paula, and uh, so glad to have you here. Were you uh, in St. Louis, we would um, have someone uh, uh, come up and bow and offer you tea. But uh, since you're in Chicago, you'll just have to imagine that. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Will, and thank you, Carol, for inviting me to speak. And I really look forward to um, sharing some Dharma with all of you and hearing what your experience of practice has been like also. So we're talking about the Lotus Sutra today, and we're also talking about how it influences our Zen training. But I'd like to start by giving you a little bit of a little bit of a background on the sutra, and then we'll just jump and dive right in. Um, first off, the definition of a lotus flower is a flower rooted in the mud of the earth as it blooms toward the sky. So very much through the Lotus Sutra, you find the idea of us as practitioners, not only working our zazen, not only working to actualize ourselves, but encourages us in very many ways to be out into the world, to be out among people, to be out and having different relationships with all kinds of people. So just like a lotus flower is rooted in the mud of the earth as it blooms to the sky, we could take this as an, an example of the encouragement the Lotus Sutra is trying to give us in our practice. It's believed this sutra emerged 500 years after the historical Buddha's death. But it's believed this teaching was actually given to the congregation, the Sangha, shortly before the Buddha died, which we know is actually Paranirvana where the Buddha left the human realm. It's also said that the reason it was not taught on a wider scale until 500 years after the Buddha died is because us practicing in this human realm, we're not ready for it yet in our own practice. Now, a lot of historians, of course, are debating whether that's true or not. But this is the story um, surrounding when the Lotus Sutra emerged for us in our practice. Now we know initially uh, when Shakyamuni became actualized and the first teaching he gave to a wider group of people was the Eightfold Path. Right views, right understanding, uh, right action, right livelihood as a guidepost on how people can practice. Also, the emphasis was on personal liberation or the liberation from our own personal suffering. Hi, Maka. So one of my students just came behind me. Um, so this was kind of the focus on practitioner's development rooted in the Eightfold Path and rooted in Zazen and mindfulness practice. The Lotus Sutra, by the time it was brought forth, started to break open 
this concept of just personalized realization. There were a number of teachings. Excuse me one moment. Mom, can you maybe sit over there, over there, over there? Yes. Okay, thank you. So from the time the Eightfold Path was taught by the Buddha to the time the Lotus Sutra made its appearance, there were a lot of other teachings brought forth in the over 40 plus years that the Buddha taught. So there wasn't just a jump from personal practice and liberation to the Lotus Sutra, but there were a lot of things in between, like the Agamas, like the emptiness teachings, like um, um, the teachings for laymen and so on and so forth. So we, we didn't make a leap from this to that right away. And I wanna preface that before we delve deeper into the Lotus Sutra. And which is also why many people believe humankind wasn't ready right away for the Lotus Sutra to be presented. But there are three types of concepts that are interwoven, or interwoven throughout the Lotus Sutra teachings. So we're gonna hit upon these three concepts as we're talking about this. The first one, the beginning of the sutra is the sutra of innumerable, innumerable meanings. And this is where the teaching of the great vehicle or the one vehicle was reinforced. Meaning that no matter what paths people are on, whether they're committed Buddhist practitioners or not, it doesn't matter because all living beings are walking along the same path. They're just using different practice means to get to actualization. And all of us at some point, every being at some point will realize actualization. So this was brought forth first and, and in a very strong and committed way in the Lotus Sutra. Now we can see if this concept has been brought forth, the idea of skillful means then emerges very easily alongside of it. Why? Now here's some of the actual words from the Lotus Sutra on immeasurable, innumerable meanings. The Buddha said, great assembly, for this reason, it is known that while the teaching is the same, the meanings differ. Since the meanings differ, so too the understandings of living beings differ. And since understandings differ, so too attainments of the Dharma, of its fruits, and of the way differ. The idea of immeasurable meanings, innumerable meanings, directly loops back into the idea of emptiness teachings, which we emphasize in Zen. Form is emptiness, emptiness is form. It also ropes into the idea that if there are innumerable meanings for innumerable beings, there has to be a myriad number of ways of engaging with people and a myriad number of ways of bringing forth the teachings. How do we decide what those ways are? We focus on the present moment as causes and conditions arise and as variables come together. In that moment, there is an appropriate response. So this is where the idea of skillful means really took root. If things are inherently empty, there is no fixed way. There is no one fixed reality. There are endless possibilities. There are endless questions. There are endless realities. Since there are these ever-changing variables, which the teaching encompasses, one might argue that that is the teaching itself. There is the possibility of unlimited meanings and unlimited un interpretations. Now, if we look at our daily life, the one thing that pops into my mind that happened to me a long time ago, even before I was practicing Buddhism, on how different beings perceive the same reality, 
I don't know if any of you have ever witnessed an accident and was asked to be um, somebody who gave their, their witness account. But when I was, um, I think, 13 or 14 years old, I was having a cup of coffee in a restaurant on a corner. And a girl was running across the street with the green light and a turning car hit her. And this is now, again, this is my view, right? The car hit her, she popped up, hit the hood, rolled off the hood, she was fine. But then the police came and wanted statements. Now we're in a busy intersection. There was at least five or six of us that saw the accident. As we all started giving our account of what we saw, the accounts were wildly different. Depending on the corner you stood on, the angle that you saw what happened and the vehicles that maybe were in your line of vision, that it started making me even question what I saw. They were wildly different. Some of them had a bus involved. Some of them had no car involved. Some of them had more pedestrians involved. It was amazing. And it was a very eye-opening experience for me at that young age. And it made me question if I'm living in the same reality as everybody else even though I wasn't practicing Buddhism at that time. So I just wanted to bring that in in case any of you have ever felt that way, then we could see the power of this teaching, that there is different perspectives, different ways of interpreting the same reality, different meanings in what's happening around us. Now, that's the first opening preface of this long sutra. It has many chapters, over 25 chapters. The next important concept that's given is the lifetime of the Tathagata. The Tathagata is sometimes another name for the Buddha. And the Tathagata means that it's a person or a being that comes and goes. I love that. <laughs> Someone who comes and goes. So here what we have, this teaching tells us that there's one Buddha that has many embodiments. So remember, if this teaching did come about right before the Buddha entered Parinirvana, people were used to them, their, people are used to a person that was there that was called Buddha, and this person left this realm. This teaching goes on to explain that even though you're seeing one Buddha, even though there is a historical Buddha, that is not the only Buddha. And the Buddha takes on different embodiments depending on the realm the Buddha appears in. We also know from our Zen practice that there isn't just one Buddha. Even historically, there's different Buddhas that appear throughout our practice that are just as much of a Buddha as Shakyamuni Buddha. But here in the Lotus Sutra, this concept of one Buddha and many embodiments finally takes hold and, and presents itself. The Buddha said right before he left our realm, even now, though I will not actually enter extinction, I announce that I will adopt the way of extinction. So here we have an example. Now he's presenting us of skillful means. He goes on to say, if people see me all the time, they become arrogant and selfish. They indulge in the five desires without restraint and fall into evil paths. I always know which living beings practice the way and which do not. In accord with what they need to be saved, I share various teachings with them and for them. I am always thinking, how can I lead all the living to enter the unexcelled way and quickly perfect their Buddha bodies. So here again, so the Buddha is presenting the concept that there's one Buddha with many embodiments. He's also roping it back into the teaching of skillful means and explaining to us how him leaving this human realm is nothing more than him using the practice of skillful means to present the teaching. And I just wanna reinforce, so the Buddha still remains among us. The Buddha is still in our realm right now, offering teachings. The Buddhas are still in our realm offering teachings. It might not be so obvious though. 
but the Buddhas offer these teachings in ways that are appropriate to the present moment. With the emphasis on multiple paths and meanings, the Buddha still being among us expounds the importance of community, engagement, and relationships. Because we don't know ourselves when we might encounter the Buddha. But if we're out in the world engaging, if we're out and about committing ourselves into various relationships as seem appropriate in that moment, we never know when we'll actually encounter a Buddha. But now we can um, extrapolate from that even more. In our Zen teachings, there is a saying called, or as said, only a Buddha and a Buddha. Okay, so now I'm gonna go further with that. Only a Buddha and a Buddha can realize Buddha Dharma. So in Zen, we even reinforce even more the importance of the relationship. Sometimes this is presented and quite often it's presented simplistically in the relationship between student and teacher in that primary relationship in Zen practice. But it doesn't only have to be in that relationship. It could be in the relationship of a husband to a wife, a parent to a child, a coworker to a boss. But here, this Lotus Sutra is explaining to us that it really is only if the Buddha has many embodiments, it almost relies on the fact of us coming together to actualize realization. Us sitting alone in a cave isn't the answer, okay? In the midst of awakening sentient beings, the Buddha Dharma is experienced. So many of the last six chapters in the Lotus Sutra encourage us in this way. Skillful means the Buddha has many embodiments and for us to be out in the world having relationships. And this really is the beginning of encouraging the Bodhisattva path. The Bodhisattva path is once you have actualized realization, instead of going off into nirvana where the cycle of rebirth has been broken, there is actually an intention to come back into the realm of samsara so that we could help other beings actualize realization, actualize enlightenment. So in this sutra, it greatly reinforces the bodhisattva path as a path to enlightenment. And all these practices are roped into this. It's not one over the other because we know there are many paths and people are practicing in many different ways on different timelines of their own life. But again, the Lotus Sutra reinforces the practice of the Bodhisattva path. So generally I'm saying, how does it reinforce it? Well, we take the, road, the Lotus Sutra, we read it, we write it, we recite it, we teach it, we entrust it. If we do these things with it, it promises healing. It promises us the development of compassion. It promises us the cultivation of wisdom. Why is it important? Why is it important to be in relationship? One aspect that gets presented in the Lotus Sutra as well is the development of compassion. So within the midst of all of this practice, compassion will be encouraged. Compassion will be experienced. Compassion will be realized. Not only for other beings, but very essentially for ourselves. We all know this from our normal lives. Um, it's easy to get along with people who you like. And then sometimes it's not so easy to get along with people you like. But on the whole, the real challenges come in with people that we do find difficult or people we know the best, right? Our family members, people we love. At times, those relationships can be very challenging. It's a great field for us to develop compassion. And I wanna stress not only for the other person, like somehow we have to just feel sorry for them, but also with how difficult it could be for us as a human being to navigate these relationships. 
If we could come to view ourselves with a softening heart as we try to navigate our way through the encouragement of having these relationships, then think how much better it would be to apply compassion then to other people when we become very aware of it for our own self first. So this sutra also um, brings forth compassion teaching, teachings and encour encouragements and also the, um, the Bodhisattva of Compassion, Avalokiteshvara, Kuan Yin, or Guan Yin, which Will has right behind him, mostly in his camera angle. That's an important part of the sutra, and you could do a lot of Dharma talks on that by itself. But I, it was important to bring it up. Um, but I do want to move on beyond the compassion component and go to the last aspect that was presented in this sutra, which is a very important, but we don't talk about a lot in Zen and in American Buddhism, um, but which is the practice of repentance. For Westerners, the idea of repentance can, can activate a lot of us because of our background in other religions where we might not have had a good experience with it, with the word. Okay, but I want to bring it up because it is an important component of the sutra and how it wraps into um, skillful means, innumerable meanings, um, the development of compassion. The last component of the Lotus Sutra is called the Sutra of Contemplation of the Dharma Practice of Universal Sage Bodhisattva. In the previous chapter, before the end of the, the greater sutra, the Universal Sage Bodhisattva appears. And when this sage appears, he promises to aid and protect all of those studying, practicing, and teaching the Lotus Sutra. So he's kind of a companion to help us along as we're trying to delve into all of this. In the final chapter, the Buddha explains how to be aided by universal sage and also how to see Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. The Buddha says, as something to assist us to see the Bodhis, Safas and the Buddhas in our realm right now is that all of us, all people, should be regarded as though they were the Buddha and all living beings as though they were one's father and mother. So if a follower, if a follower, if a follower practices the Lotus Sutra, the follower could very easily say this. Thanks to the great vehicle, the one vehicle, I have been able to see great leaders. Because of the powers of great leaders, I have also been able to see Buddhas. Though I have seen these Buddhas, still I have not seen them completely. When I close my eyes, I see the Buddhas, but when I open my eyes, I lose sight of them. So then the last part of the Lotus Sutra offers the question, how does a follower no longer lose sight of the Buddhas? How does the follower no longer lose sight of the Bodhisattvas? So if we realize them and open our eyes, for me, this is a metaphor of going out into the real world. Why are we losing sight of? And then the idea of repentance is very subtly inserted into the text. We are not beaten with a club with it, but it says, oh, the way you see the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas all the time is you practice repentance. Um, some of you might be familiar, there's a repentance verse in Zen Buddhism, all my ancient twist and karma through beginningless greed, hate and delusion, I now fully avow. That's how you practice repentance, that's it. That's the main go-to if you're not sure how to practice it. But basically, simply, we're not beating ourselves up about things that could be a misdirection in our life, but it's knowing when we know we could have done better. And using that compassion on our ability to find the way. The compassion starts from us admitting times when we were wrong. 
And then usually once a month, we could take our Bodhisattva precepts over again, which there are 16 of them. In, in the Eightfold Path, it's kind of wrapped up into those 16 Bodhisattva precepts. But it's a way of recommitting to us walking the Bodhisattva path, walking along the way of this practice. So repentance by, by itself is not meant to bludgeon us into some kind of conformity. It's meant for us to just realize that at times we have to take a personal assessment and check inside how we feel we're doing. And if we feel inside something is a little bit off, it's important for us to admit it, if not to other people, to ourselves, and to forgive ourselves as we move forward. We could do another Dharma talk on repentance and there, because there's a lot of stuff wrapped into that. Um, but again, I wanna stress the idea is not to be punitive, it's to balance out karmic hindrances for us as we move forward in our practice. And in this way, our human field then is attuned to the instruction of the Buddhas. It's in tuned to our own inherent intuition. And then the ground for each of us is fertile to develop wisdom. All of this comes in a symbiotic way through our practice. None of it is linear. None of it goes from point A to point B to point C. It's very circular and goes back and forth. Um, so I'm starting to wrap up the presentation side of this, but I want I to kind of hit upon a few words again that's laced through the Lotus Sutra. Um, when we talk about immeasurable meanings, emptiness, relationship, compassion, repentance, and the development of wisdom. The sutra teaches that everyone without exception, everyone without exception has the potential to be a Buddha. A Buddha is one who sees the potential and good of good in others, even in enemies. I used the um, Jean Reeves translation of the Lotus Sutra for my own study of it and for this talk. So I wanna end this with words that he gives us from his introduction to the Sutra. All readers of the Lotus Sutra would be well advised to ask what the story is saying about themselves. And I think that's probably a lot. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Paula. I, I, um, I, I so appreciate that. And uh, it, um, um, it certainly encourages me to delve more into this text and, and, and to, to perhaps explore the outer, the outer world more as well. Um, but um, I, I, uh, I wonder if there are any questions or, or comments um, for, for Paula um, among the group. We will first though uh, stop the recording so that you can rest assured 